Good evening and welcome to TDM Talk Show. I'm your host, Kelsey Wilhelm. Our guest this evening is Charles Long, the winner of the Formula 4 Macau Grand Prix, a historic win for both Long and Macau. No stranger to the circuit, Long has raced internationally for years, also championing Formula 4 and Formula Renault. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for the invite. And yeah, it's an honor to come. It's been um, an exciting week. Yeah, of course. It's like <laughs> I've just reached one of my dream that I was dreaming for like for a long time. Mm -hmm. So it was actually really special for me. I have to start off with the cheesy question. Um, it's the same one that everyone asks. I mean, when, when you got up to that podium, not only because when you win the race, there's always that kind of post-race uh, adrenaline and it hasn't really sunk in that you've won yet. But then once you got up on the podium and they handed you the, the, the trophy, the award, how, what was going through your head? Like, to be fair, like, and to be honest, I think I was actually quite like blanked out. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. like yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I was like, what's happening? <laughs> because especially when I just passed a checker flag, like when I was going around the track, like slowly, I was like, I've just won in like the place I grew up. Yeah. So yeah, like I don't really know how to describe how it feels, but it's just like very, very special and it's amazing. Well, you've spent a long time chasing this dream also and, and you've been racing for, for a long time. Um, the track in and of itself, you yourself have called it one of the most difficult tracks or the, most, the best track in the world. Uh, why do you think that is? I know there are a lot of factors that go into it, especially you know, being from Macau, there's a, there's a personal relationship to the track. But why do you think it is the best track in the world? First of all, in Macau, you can't have any mistakes in the corners, especially the mountain part. Like, mm -hmm. It's really fast through there. And like, every time you need to catch the rhythm right in order to do the good lap time as well. And Macau is a track that provides overtaking chances. Like because we have a very long straight and we have we could have a very good if we have a very good run through the last corner, mm -hmm. you have a very good slipstream and you get to pass. And you actually get to fight here. Mm -hmm. And the top speed here is always like very amazing because mm -hmm. you have such a long straight and you're at the you're near the cold side. So like the air resistant and the air is a bit less dense. Mm -hmm. So yeah, everything is just going quicker here. How about for, for you during the race? Did you ever have a moment where you were worried? Because you started from pole position. Did you have any moments when you were worried, particularly maybe there towards the end, once the competition was able to catch up with you because you were being blocked off by some of the cars that you couldn't yet find space to lap? Were you, were you worried at all at any point? Uh, at the start, I think I did pretty well. But the only part I was worried is about the slipstream as well. Because mm -hmm. at the start, it's really long. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was close. He was side by side through this ball with me at that time. But at the end, I was actually quite like worried. And because like my, my advantage is just gone. Mm -hmm. Like three seconds is like because of a slow car, it got blocked. And yeah, just not ideal. But just trying to keep myself calm and make sure I don't make many mistakes to Win, win the race. Mm -hmm. The Formula 4 cars you've, you're familiar with, you've raced in them before. Um, this is a first for Macau in terms of having, well, in terms of the whole world, obviously, the, the racing world has been highly affected by this pandemic and Macau has been affected in terms of our events and many other things. Did you, having raced pr in previous editions of the Macau Grand Prix, what, was, what did it feel like to as a racer there? Did it feel different? Did it feel smaller? Did it feel...? Uh, I think it feels pretty much the same for me because okay. you still get to race here and you, yeah, you can still try and reach, reach my dream. Mm -hmm. You know, like, even though everyone knows the truth is like this year's championship level is a bit lower, but it's still quite hard for us as a driver because this track is just way too challenging. Yeah. And I think it's actually quite special as well that we get to have such a big event happening in Macau, like because everywhere is like suffering a lot and every other places it's not going the way they want. But mm -hmm. in Macau we can start up this race 
I think it's just amazing, and we actually proving to the world that the government did really well on the on the COVID situation. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's really, really positive that this thing happened. A lot of people were worried that it wasn't going to happen, and we didn't really have an indication until towards the end. Uh, well, towards the end of the year, for sure that we were going to have the Grand Prix at all and which races were going to be happening. I mean, the Motorcycle Grand Prix was obviously something that we were sad to see not happen. The F3 would have been nice also, but the F4 brought this highlight to, to the stage. Um, but as I mentioned before, you have, oh, actually, you're the first Macau driver to win the Macau Grand Prix uh, in terms of formula since Andre Cotto in 2000, right? Yeah, I think so. So it's been 19 years, well, it's been 20 years since a Macau driver. What do you think is the significance of that? Like for, for Macau and for the Macau population, for Macau drivers, for Macau aspiring drivers? Like, I think it actually shows that we are capable to, like, reaching that level. And Macau actually have a lot of talented young drivers as well. And it, I think we just need to spend some time and find a way to support them. Mm -hmm. And maybe later on I will try to send some video footage of my driving and some on board mm -hmm. online so people could actually have a look and see my driving and see my level because mm -hmm. I think many people think Formula 4, oh, it's not a really great car, it's a lot slower. But when you actually see the onboard inside there, it's amazing. Like mm -hmm. you're just right next to the wall every time like one one more millimeter you're gonna crash so yeah i think that's something i'm gonna do and maybe some kids can have a look at it and maybe it, i hope i could inspire them to get into racing just make sure to tell them that they have to start off on the race track <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> um just out of curiosity i i have had the pleasure of interviewing andre koto before um have you ever raced i know that w against koto um, against Andre Koto. I know that you've had some races that were taking place at the same event over the same weekend, but I think you guys were racing in different classes. Yeah, he was racing in the GT cars, yeah. but I think I was racing uh, mainly in Formula Renault and Formula 4 when okay. I was around Asia. Okay. So, yeah, never. All right, all right. And I remember him coming to my pit to say hi and give me some very good suggestion for the Grand Prix. Awesome. So. Yeah, it was a lot of help yeah, for me in the first two years. Good, good, yeah. good. It's interesting to see that so when you're there in the pit um, and you know we're there most years, TDM's there every year, obviously. Um, when you're there in the pit, you see the camaraderie and you see the help, how the, the drivers are all talking to each other and, and supporting each other, even though technically each person wants to win. <laughs> Do you think that there's been a... What is your feeling of, of family within the racing community? Mm, family has always been my first priority. Mm -hmm. But um, I know some parents might feel like it's a really dangerous sport. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But I think my family is pretty fine with it, but I don't think this race is actually as dangerous as people thought because every year the FIA try to improve mm -hmm. the yeah. safety, basically everything. Mm -hmm. Like and the car this year is like with a, especially with the halo, it's it's a huge advantage on the safety part. Yeah, and everyone is actually going, like going for more because you, they feel more safe as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and every year like you don't really see many drivers actually has like a huge impact. Or even though last year it's actually really sad. Yeah. To Antoine. Mm -hmm to have that incident, but I think FI is actually trying really hard and to improve the safety issue. Yeah, we, we, know, we noticed that. They do come around, they do so many inspections, pay attention to every minute detail, trying to make sure that it's on track. But I wanted to ask for you personally, I know that you've had a couple, uh, like in the F3, unfortunately you were involved in an accident before. Um, have you had any bad accidents? I think my worst accident was in 2016 mm -hmm. and I actually have a broken arm because of the other go kart. I'm smiling but I shouldn't be smiling, a broken arm is nothing to be happy about. <laughs> yeah, and I've actually had a, quite a bad crash. The other cart is like stacked on my arm so I've actually have, have had a broken bone. Ow. 
Yeah, and when I was checking the hospital back in uh, Beijing, mm -hmm. and then they checked and it's not at the right spot, so they actually pull my arm, and they don't give you any painkiller. Ooh. Yeah, but after but afterward, they didn't actually check it again to see if it's at the right spot yet. And then after three days, I can actually raise my arm again. And then I went to the hospital in Macau and they checked again. It's still not at the right, oh, no. right spot. Oh no. And I remember the doctor is telling me that you're still pretty young. You can take the pain. Let's, <laughs> let's do it. And then they actually broke my arm again to put oh. it at the right spot. And actually that time it did went back. So. I'm, I'm glad. I mean, it doesn't look <laughs> sideways. So that's, yeah. that's, that's helpful. How, was, how did your parents react to that? I mean, they, obviously it's always easier in theory to be doing something like racing. But then when an accident happens, um, it kind of drives the point home that it is a dangerous sport. How, how did your parents, did they change their mindset at all after, after the, that accident? Um, I think did my, you have to convince them? <laughs> uh, no, actually my dad's pretty fine with it. I think he expected someday that I might get injured. Uh, I actually don't know what my parents are actually thinking because they don't seem seems to give a lot of face expression okay. <laughs> or anything to me when I actually had a broken arm. Okay. And yeah, they, and they, but they actually asked me if I still want to continue this. And I was like, yeah, for sure. Like right. something I really want to do. The choice was yours. That's impressive. Yeah. And As a young adult, you don't get that many important choices. <laughs> yeah. I think I was really lucky that my family is pretty open with what I'm thinking and what I actually want to do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think I'm pretty lucky on that part. Good, good, good. How did, how did all of this start? Um, I know that a lot of people like to drive fast, but not, not many people are able to, to develop that into a career, especially at such a young age. How, how did you get interested in, in racing? I, when I was three or four, I think there was like a Japanese animate, mm -hmm. and then it's called Inisha D. Okay. And I was just like, I fall in love with it. I was just replaying it like every day. Mm -hmm. And then later on, they had a movie about it and involved like few celebrities from Hong Kong and Taiwan. All right. And yeah, I was watching it basically every day and my brother actually got annoyed once and I just, <laughs> and he just threw my DVD actually. Yeah. And yeah, it just, it's about drifting. And I think that movie actually inspired quite a lot of people to get into those like touring car stuff. Okay. So yeah, and that's the first thing I've actually get like, get myself into it. Mm -hmm. And I think the other main thing that my dad actually let me go for go-karting is he watched me going into the arcade places okay. when I was yeah, a kid. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I was doing, playing some arcade games about that movie as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I was winning the other one. I was like four or five as well. So Okay. Yeah. Was it legal for you to be in the arcade at four or five years old? I don't think it's that. I don't. I don't think it's that organized at that time. So, yeah, I, I get to sneak in, All right. even though I'm like a kid. <laughs> yeah. So how do you take it from the? I mean, normally the the progression is yeah, you'll do the arcade games, and then it's karting, right? Mm -hmm. And then so you start karting. What's the next step after karting? What was your next step after karting? Actually, my first time in the Formula Four car that I drove last week was when I was 13. That's young. Yeah, and I remember the first time I went in that car and there's like three sessions per day and I went up two sessions like into the gravel. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I remember it was raining, but at the last session I remember I still managed to do quite a good lap time and I actually impressed the team. Okay. So yeah, like everyone's next step is basically Formula 4 at that time. So. Okay. Yeah, a lot of competitive go-kart drivers went into that category and yeah, if they win, they go to Formula 3. Mm -hmm. But you've gotten to, uh, there was an interesting thing we were talking about earlier before because you were talking about having raced in Europe as well, not only within Asia. Um, but there are differences, there, this is a nuance that I wasn't quite um, informed about. The F3 cars, for example, you were talking about racing F3 in Europe versus racing in Asia. What, what is the difference? Like the Asian F3 race is actually the first uh, category except Formula 1 that has the halo. Mm -hmm. And that car is a lot heavier, like even though it has a bit more horsepower, but the car is still quite a bit slower than a European F3 car. Mm -hmm. And 
it feels like driving a GT car because it's okay. actually quite heavy. Mm -hmm. But the European after car is a very interesting car because it's like a very big go car. Like you get to push every lap and you get to like basically throw your car into the corners all the time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, everyone loves that car because that car is just amazing. You get to push every every lap and yeah, go for the limit all the time. <laughs> And the new after car now that we had last year, there are DR, there is like a DRS. Mm -hmm. So yeah, quite a bit faster on the street again and we managed to reach three hundred and five, but for me it was three hundred. Okay. Yeah, with a slipstream as well. Okay. In Macau. So that was actually very impressive. And that car feels like driving a bus but with a one thousand horsepower engine inside <laughs> it. So yeah, it doesn't sound like an easy thing to do, especially navigating parts. You know, coming after well, going up on the mountainside, for example, after the um, the lighthouse. There's some really well coming up to the lighthouse. There's some really sharp turns around there. It doesn't feel like you want to be driving a bus. I've seen how some of the bus drivers drive here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are very impressive as well. I've seen like quite a few. Impressive, yeah. That's that's one word for them. <laughs> what about some of your um, your other? Uh, ideas for how to help racers here in Macau try and discover that talent and, and be able to have access to it. Because Macau has the, the Macau Grand Prix, right? But we don't have a regular circuit. We have the go-karting circuit. Uh, Juhai actually does have its own circuit over there. Um, how could these aspiring young race car drivers uh, find their passion? What's some of the avenues? Like right now, I'm trying to work a bit with the simulator stuff mm -hmm. and maybe try to grab some young drivers, like maybe some young kids to see if they're interested in racing or not and yeah, let them have a goal and let's see if they're actually good at it or not and mm -hmm. probably one day if they actually fall in love with it, I can bring them into the go-kart track, like anywhere, like if they're good, I can do anything for them. Okay. Like, because that is actually one of my target in the future as well, to find some really young, talented drivers from Macau as well. So, yeah. Let's see. Well, you've proved that, that Macau drivers can win, that's for sure. What, I'm just curious because it's, it's so young um, that people start off with in racing. What, what is some of the ages of the people that you're looking at who are in, you know, working the simulators and, and how old would they be when they would get into the go-karts? Like, I'm actually aiming for like people that are around four to six mm -hmm. into the simulator place because mm -hmm. when I was four to six, I was already in the arcade, yeah. like racing against a big, people mm -hmm. and yeah to to see if they are actually talented or not okay because it's actually pretty to see from it because young young people can actually learn very fast as well yeah. so yeah I'll see from there and I actually think the best age to get into go-kart it's around six okay. yeah around six okay okay and a lot of like famous Formula One drivers they've actually done go-kart when they're three so yeah, I think. So they started walking, and then they started talking, yeah, and then start they driving. started racing. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like, uh, yeah, my parents wouldn't let me do that. I, I had a bicycle. That was, that was pretty much the extent. <laughs> I wanted to ask, in, in preparing for this race, um, obviously everything is, the whole racing world had been basically shut down to the extent where, you know, they were doing those, um, the online, even the simulated ones where you would see some of the drivers just these are, you know, famous drivers, but then they're they're racing as if it were a video game. You know, you'd see some of the cars jump over each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was quite amusing. But the whole racing world basically shut down for the first however many months of the year, and then they had gradual reopenings. How was it to then try and train and prepare for for this race for you? Like, to be fair, like the decision was made pretty late as well. Mm -hmm. Like. I actually know that I'm gonna do Macau Grand Prix when it was around the end of August and the start of September. Okay. So, but before that, I was always doing some simulator and some go karting mm -hmm. to keep myself up the rhythm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that was pretty much that I've done. But I think it still helped me quite a lot with the simulators because, like, to be honest, the technique there. It's actually pretty similar to the real car. Okay. Like a lot of people think it's just gaming, but mm -hmm. when you actually have the right parts yeah. of the simulator and the right steering wheels, mm -hmm. like it actually feel, pre feels pretty much the same, but you just don't have the G-force, you don't have the wind, you don't have yeah. the feeling. Mm -hmm. But 
when you turn into the corners and the paddles, like the throttle and braking, the technique is pretty much the same. Okay. Yeah. That's surprising, actually. I'm. That means that I'm a terrible, terrible driver. If I'm going going based upon my video gaming experience, I'm I'm not even within the sim, well within the arcade games. Yeah, I was I was in last, crashed into the wall. Um, there's so much of it that that is uh, visible not only from within the cockpit of what you're doing and and the minute things that make a huge difference, but what about the team behind you? The team behind me, they're all from China. Mm -hmm. And this time I've actually got another engineer that was working with me when I was doing Asian Formula, oh no, Asian Formula Renault okay. and Formula Ford. Mm -hmm. I've actually contacted him and maybe asked for some help and suggestion because he's actually pretty mature with those setup stuff. And okay. yeah, he just gave me confidence as well. So I actually work with him as well and also with the team to mm -hmm. try to see how to compromise everything together to build a good car for the Grand Prix. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the Chinese team, it's pretty good and pretty decent. A lot of people think that Chinese people are just messy or sometimes, you know. Okay. But I think they are pretty organized mm -hmm. and surprisingly we, we've, we've won and everything no mistakes and the car is good for the race so but they're they're there in your ear the whole time right in my ear you mean yeah. by in a headset when you're when you're driving you you're still in contact with them right uh no not no? this time okay yeah okay. because so all the decisions you're making there are completely on your own they're not they're not suggesting anything they're not talking to you nah in the race no because We've actually tried to work out our video, uh, radio, mm -hmm. but for some reason our radio is not working okay. here because of the um, it's not registered in Macau. Okay. Yeah, you know those okay. those yeah, yeah, yeah. those stuff is a bit <laughs> like All annoying. Right. So uh -huh. yeah, we we didn't manage to have the radio. You're so. driving completely on your own. That's impressive. Yeah. So you didn't have anybody saying tires, tires. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, I was pretty focused just to like race and based on my own experience. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I've won, so I think I'm, I'm not bad at it. <laughs> right, I'd say. Um, there are certain surprising things about racing that um, a lot of people who, you know, just drive normally don't really think about, um, specifically the tires. So when, when you talk about, you know, not pushing it too hard in the beginning, saving the tires, what, what exactly are you doing? Are you worried that the tire is going to wear down, heat up, lose traction, what, what all is the, the reason for trying to save the tires towards the end? Like, it really depends on the condition. Sometimes when it's too hot, mm -hmm. I just go a bit of a step back into the corners just to be a bit more like smooth on everything mm -hmm. and not to spin the tires because when I was actually pushing mm -hmm. for a qualifying lap, my car was moving all the time, like moving a bit, like right yeah. on the limit of the grip. So. Yeah, just not to do too much of that and make yeah. sure the tires is at the right temperature and it all really based on feeling of it of the driver so okay yeah it's kind of hard yeah i bet because i mean the slightest thing if you if you spin out just a little bit then you're in the wall That's yeah it. And especially the, macau yeah the car falls apart <laughs> <laughs> um i wanted to ask one part is um always challenging for everyone and we've you know, been talking with racers for, for decades about this and, and financing is such a key part of being able to, to not only get into racing but then to have the winning, uh, winning team and the winning driver. Um, I know that financing is, is very difficult in general. How do people go about financing? Just because I know a lot of the people at home don't know how this whole thing works. Do you have to seek out sponsors? Um, is it based on a track record? How, how does that work? Like sponsor has uh, has always been a big issue for me mm -hmm. because for me I've actually wasted like nearly a year and a half in my career when it's I was seventeen to nineteen mm -hmm. and that was actually a very important time in for a racing driver. Okay. Because I can't go back to Formula Four to race again when you win it. Like I have to be in Formula Three, but yeah, I just don't have the budget to do it. Like sponsor has always been like quite a big effect for me, but. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm managing that part well, but yeah, I think it's really about opportunities and if 
the government actually want to support you. But I think the government actually did very well in supporting me already because they need to face a lot of like negative comments if they actually give me a lot of money to do racing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. On the financial part, like, mm -hmm. it's really hard for, for them. Like, because even though it's not enough for the whole season, but it's still quite a big help that it actually support me to do the Macau Grand Prix and it actually helped me to reach my dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, it's a key part, and we have seen that uh, the government is supporting not only the events themselves, but also the the teams in trying to do that. There, uh, I remember that there always used to be an end of end of race bonus or something like that. If you complete the actual race without crashing, then you're eligible for a certain um, amount. Is that is that still? Yeah, in I, yes, there's some bonus, but it's actually not enough. Not very for your, for your yeah. like other parts of racing because mm -hmm. you actually spend quite a lot of, lot of money inside if you don't have the sponsor. Yeah. So you, you make no money. A lot of people think we steal the government money, but we actually don't. Like because we actually spend more than the money. That yeah. like, so it's an expensive sport. <laughs> yes, yeah, actually quite expensive and like. You actually really need an experienced person in motorsport in order to give you the right path as well. Like for example, the right team, mm -hmm. the sponsorship, and maybe even on your physical part. Mm -hmm. Like you need a person to support you on that. But I think Macau, they actually need a person like this in order to keep the Macau drivers on the stage. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's see what is gonna happen though because I'm actually aiming for to be that person as well mm -hmm. and I think I'm the most experienced one so far okay and hopefully I can do something with it as well so you've been you're and you're working towards that goal you're also studying um, which has been it's complicated to be both a you know professional race car driver and be studying uh, especially university um, so, so uh, tell me a little bit more about that with uh, with your university studies. I know that you were you wanted to be in the UK. Um, obviously, circumstances have made it a little bit more difficult. Um, what what exactly are you studying, and, and where do you think that can take you? Like the course name is actually quite long, and when people ask me, it's I've uh, told them it's about sport management, sport business, sport psychology, and sport science. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite a new course for like university so I think I was at the right time as well and I think I picked the right course and maybe I can aim for the target that I'm aiming for now. Mm -hmm. Which is the most difficult part of that of that course? <laughs> so far I think it's quite common sense but like it's just the English part that confused me sometimes because I think I'm pretty fine in talking but not when there is some like very long or complicated vocabs. Oh, fair enough. And yeah. yeah. Essays are never fun for anybody, believe me. <laughs> yeah, I've never liked essay as well. I'm <laughs> not a good English writer. <laughs> it's all right. There's plenty of time for that. And luckily, um, if your goal is to then come back and start helping all of these young racers and, and try and keep the uh, Macau on the map within this, then I think that you're very well set for it, especially after a win at the Formula 4 Macau Grand Prix. Yep, and right now I'm still also trying to see how I can work with the team in China, mm -hmm. like the team I race with, mm -hmm. to pick a few young Chinese drivers as well to help, help them. Okay. Yeah, because the team manager actually told me to see if we can work together. And they're pretty talented as well and very young. And one of them is 14 and one of them is 17. Okay. Yeah, I think okay, okay. there are some chance. Yeah. for them to win next year and they're doing very well as well in the practice. It's, it's good that you're able to also share your, your experience with them because um, it's a very interesting time, you know, the, the teenage years uh, and if you're constantly busy and you don't necessarily get to have as much of a social life, there's a lot of pressure for these young drivers. So do you think you can help uh, mentor them in a certain way? Yeah, for sure. Like, Don't do this, do that. <laughs> yeah, not don't do what I did. <laughs> yeah, I think if you're actually like a good athlete, you mm -hmm. could be open-minded most yeah. of the time. Like you just need some small support, like mm -hmm. just a few words. Like if you're actually the person to success, I think a few words can fix him. Yeah, yeah, that's what I've always think of, and even for me, in the mental part, I actually push myself a lot 
all the time, like, even though there are some negative comments sometimes. But yeah, I don't really care mm -hmm. <laughs> and just do what I want and go for the right direction. And also when you see Max Verstappen crashing quite a bit yeah. in the last few years and people are like giving him a lot of negative stuff, but he, he didn't really care. Like he just go for like, what he wants and he actually did really well all the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he's one of the target that I want to be in the future to have his mental part. All right. Well, unfortunately, our time is drawn to a close here. It goes quicker than you would expect, but not as fast as you when you're driving in the Grand Prix. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show. Congratulations. This is a historic moment, not only for yourself, but also for Macau. Yep. Yeah, hopefully I could inspire some people and let's see in the future if I can do something to help out the young drivers and yeah, going to be some positive times. Later on. We look forward to seeing the, the continued progression of your career in, in every shape that it takes. Thank you very much for being thank here. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for inviting. Uh, thank you for joining us. That's all for this evening. Tune in again next week for more TDM Talk Show. Good night.